The opening scene to John Steinbeck's novel of Mice and Men, read by Britton Hall. A few miles south of Soledad, the Salinas River drops in close to the hillside bank and runs deep and green. The water is warm, too, for it has slipped twinkling over the yellow sands in the sunlight before reaching the narrow pool. On one side of the river, the golden foothill slopes curve up to the strong and rocky Gabalin Mountains. But on the valley side, the water is lined with trees, willows fresh and green with every spring, carrying in their lower leaf junctures the debris of the winter's flooding, and sycamores with mottled, white, recumbent limbs and branches that arch over the pool. On the sandy bank under the trees, the leaves lie deep and so crisp that a lizard makes a great skittering if he runs among them. Rabbits come out of the brush to sit on the sand in the evening, and the damp flats are covered with the night tracks of coons, and with the spread pads of dogs from the ranches, and with the split wedge tracks of deer that come to drink in the dark. There is a path through the willows and among the sycamores, a path beaten hard by boys coming down from the ranches to swim in the deep pool and beaten hard by tramps who come wearily down from the highway in the evening to jungle up near water. In front of the low horizontal limb of a giant sycamore, there is an ash pile made by many fires the limb is worn smooth by men who have sat on it. Evening of a hot day started the little wind to moving among the leaves. The shade climbed up the hills toward the top. On the sandbanks, the rabbits sat as quietly as little gray sculptured stones. And then from the direction of the state highway came the sound of footsteps on crisp sycamore leaves. The rabbits hurried noiselessly for cover. A stilted heron labored up into the air and pounded downriver. For a moment the place was lifeless. And then two men emerged from the path and came into the opening by the green pool. They had walked in single file down the path, and even in the open one stayed behind the other. Both were dressed in denim trousers and in denim coats with brass buttons. Both wore black, shapeless hats, and both carried tight blanket rolls slung over their shoulders. The first man was small and quick, dark of face, with restless eyes and strong, sharp features. Every part of him was defined. Small, strong hands, slender arms, a thin and bony nose. Behind him walked his opposite, a huge man, shapeless of face, with large, pale eyes, with wide, sloping shoulders, and he walked heavily, dragging his feet a little, the way a bear drags his paws. His arms did not swing at his sides, but hung loosely. The first man stopped short in the clearing, and the follower nearly ran over him. He took off his hat, and wiped the sweat band with his forefinger and snapped the moisture off. His huge companion dropped his blankets and flung himself down and drank from the surface of the green pool, drank with long gulps, snorting into the water like a horse. The small man stepped nervously beside him. Lenny, he said sharply. Lenny, for God's sakes, don't drink so much. Lenny continued to snort into the pool. The small man leaned over and shook him by the shoulder. Lenny, you're going to be sick like you was last night. Lenny dipped his whole head under, hat and all, and then he sat up on the bank, and his hat dripped down on his blue coat and ran down his back. That's good, he said. You drink some, George. You take a good big drink. He smiled happily. George unslung his bindle and dropped it gently on the bank. I ain't sure it's good water, he said. Looks kinda scummy. Lenny dabbled his big paw in the water 
and wiggled his fingers, so the water arose in little splashes. Rings widened across the pool to the other side and came back again. Lenny watched them go. Look, George, look what I done. George knelt beside the pool and drank from his hand with quick scoops. Tastes all right, he admitted. Don't really seem to be running, though. You never ought to drink water when it ain't running, Lenny, he said hopelessly. You'd drink out of a gutter if you was thirsty. He threw a scoop of water into his face and rubbed it about with his hand, under his chin and around the back of his neck. Then he replaced his hat, pushed himself back from the river, drew up his knees and embraced them. Lenny, who had been watching, imitated George exactly. He pushed himself back, drew up his knees, embraced them, looked over to George to see whether he had it just right. He pulled his hat down a little more over his eyes, the way George's hat was. George stared morosely at the water. The rims of his eyes were red with sun glare. He said angrily, we could just as well have rode clear to the ranch if that bastard bus driver knew what he was talking about. Just a little stretch down the highway, he says. Just a little stretch. Goddamn near four miles, that's what it was. Didn't want to stop at the ranch gate, that's what. Too goddamn lazy to pull up. Wonder he isn't too damn good to stop in Soledad at all. Kicks us out and says... Just a little stretch down the road. I bet it was more than four miles. Damn hot day. Lenny looked timidly over to him. George? Yeah, what you want? Where are we going, George? The little man jerked down the brim of his hat and scowled over at Lenny. So you forgot that already, did you? I gotta tell you again, do I? Jesus Christ, you're a crazy bastard. I forgot, Lenny said softly. I tried not to forget. Honest to God, I did, George. Okay, okay. I'll tell you again. I ain't got nothing to do. Might just as well spend all my time telling you things, and then you forget them, and I tell you again. Tried and tried, said Lenny, but it didn't do no good. I remember about the rabbits, George. The hell with the rabbits. That's all you ever can remember is them rabbits. Okay, now you listen, and this time you got to remember so we don't get in no trouble. You remember settin' in that gutter on Howard Street and watching that blackboard? Lenny's face broke into a delighted smile. Why, sure, George, I remember that. But... What'd we do then? I remember some girls come by and you says, you say, the hell with what I says. You remember about us going into Murray and Reddy's and they give us work cards and bus tickets? Oh, sure, George, I remember that now. His hands went quickly into his side coat pockets. He said gently, George, I ain't got mine. I must have lost it. He looked down at the ground in despair. You never had none, you crazy bastard. I got both of them here. Think I'd let you carry your own work card? Lenny grinned with relief. I... I thought I put it in my side pocket. His hand went into the pocket again. George looked sharply at him. What did you take out of that pocket? Ain't a thing in my pocket, Lenny said cleverly. I know there ain't. You got it in your hand. What do you got in your hand? Hiding it. I ain't got nothing, George. Honest. Come on, give it here. Lenny held his closed hand away from George's direction. It's only a mouse, George. A mouse? A live mouse? Uh-uh. Just a dead mouse, George. I didn't kill it. Honest. I found it. I found it dead. Give it here, said George. Oh, leave me have it, George. Give it here. Lenny's closed hand slowly obeyed. 
George took the mouse and threw it across the pool to the other side, among the brush. What do you want of a dead mouse anyways? I could pet it with my thumb while we walked along, said Lenny. Well, you ain't petting no mice while you walk with me. You remember where we're going now? Lenny looked startled, and then in embarrassment hid his face against his knees. I forgot again. Jesus Christ, George said resignedly. Well, look, we're going to work on a ranch like the one we come from up north. Up north? In weed. Oh, sure, I remember, in weed. That ranch we're going to is right down there about a quarter mile. We're going to go in and see the boss. Now look, I'll give him the work tickets, but you ain't going to say a word. You just stand there and don't say nothing. If he finds out what a crazy bastard you are, we won't get no job. But if he sees you work before he hears you talk, we're set. You got that? Sure, George. Sure, I got it. Okay, now when we go in to see the boss, what you gonna do? I, I, Lenny thought. His face grew tight with thought. I ain't gonna say nothing, just gonna stand there. Good boy, that's swell. You say that over two, three times so you sure won't forget it. Lenny droned to himself softly. I ain't gonna say nothing. I ain't gonna say nothing. I ain't gonna say nothing. Okay, said George. And you ain't gonna do no bad things like you done in weed, neither. Lenny looked puzzled. Like I done in weed? Oh, so you forgot that too, did you? Well, I ain't gonna remind you. Fear you do it again. A light of understanding broke on Lenny's face. They run us out of weed, he exploded triumphantly. Run us out, hell, said George disgustedly. We run. They was looking for us, but they didn't catch us. Lenny giggled happily. I didn't forget that. You bet. George lay back on the sand and crossed his hands under his head, and Lenny imitated him, raising his head to see whether he were doing it right. God, you're a lot of trouble, said George. I could get along so easy and so nice if I didn't have you on my tail. I could live so easy and maybe have a girl. For a moment, Lenny lay quiet. And then he said hopefully, We gonna work on a ranch, George. All right, you got that. But we're gonna sleep here because I got a reason. The day was going fast now. Only the tops of the Gabalin Mountains flamed with the light of the sun that had gone from the valley. A water snake slipped along on the pool, its head held up like a little periscope. The reeds jerked slightly in the current. Far off toward the highway, a man shouted something, and another man shouted back. The sycamore limbs rustled under a little wind that died immediately. George... Why ain't we going on to the ranch and get some supper? They got supper at the ranch. George rolled on to his side. No reason at all for you. I like it here. Tomorrow we're going to go to work. I seen thrashing machines on the way down. That means we'll be bucking grain bags, busting a gut. Tonight I'm going to lay right here and look up. I like it. Lenny got up on his knees and looked down at George. Ain't we gonna have no supper? Sure we are, if you gather up some dead willow sticks. I got three cans of beans in my bindle. You get a fire ready. I'll give you a match when you get the sticks together. Then we'll heat the beans and have supper. Lenny said, I like beans with ketchup. Well, we ain't got no ketchup. You go get wood, and don't you fool around. It'll be dark before long. Lenny lumbered to his feet and disappeared in the brush. George lay where he was and whistled softly to himself. There were sounds of splashings down the river in the direction Lenny had taken. George stopped whistling and listened. Poor bastard, he said softly, and then went on whistling again. In a moment, Lenny came crashing back through the brush. He carried one small willow stick in his hand. 
George sat up. All right, he said brusquely. Give me that mouse. But Lenny made an elaborate pantomime of innocence. What mouse, George? I ain't got no mouse. George held out his hand. Come on, give it to me. You ain't putting nothing over. Lenny hesitated, backed away, looked wildly at the brush line as though he contemplated running for his freedom. George said coldly, You gonna give me that mouse or do I have to sock you? Give you what, George? You know goddamn well what. I want that mouse. Lenny reluctantly reached into his pocket. His voice broke a little. I don't know why I can't keep it. It ain't nobody's mouse. I didn't steal it. I found it lying right beside the road. George's hand remained outstretched imperiously. Slowly, like a terrier who doesn't want to bring a ball to its master, Lenny approached, drew back, approached again. George snapped his fingers sharply, and at the sound, Lenny laid the mouse in his hand. I wasn't doing nothing bad with it, George, just stroking it. George stood up and threw the mouse as far as he could into the darkening brush, and then he stepped to the pool and washed his hands. You crazy fool! Don't you think I could see your feet was wet where you went across the river to get it? He heard Lenny's whimpering cry and wheeled about, blubbering like a baby. Jesus Christ, a big guy like you. Lenny's lip quivered and tears started in his eyes. Oh, Lenny. George put a hand on Lenny's shoulder. I ain't taking it away just for meanness. That mouse ain't fresh, Lenny. And besides, you broke it, petting it. You get another mouse that's fresh, and I'll let you keep it a little while. Lenny sat down on the ground and hung his head dejectedly. I don't know where there is no other mouse. I remember a lady used to give them to me. Every one she got. But that lady ain't here. George scoffed. Lady, huh? Don't even remember who that lady was. That was your own Aunt Clara, and she stopped giving them to you. You always killed them. Lenny looked sadly up at him. They were so little, he said apologetically. I'd pet them, and pretty soon they bit my fingers, and I pinched their heads a little, and then they was dead because they were so little. I wish we'd get the rabbits pretty soon, George. They ain't so little. The hell with the rabbits, and you ain't to be trusted with no live mice. Your Aunt Clara give you a rubber mouse, and you wouldn't have nothing to do with it. It wasn't no good to pet, said Lenny. The flame of the sunset lifted from the mountain tops, and dusk came into the valley, and a half-darkness came in among the willows and the sycamores. A big carp rose to the surface of the pool, gulped air, and then sank mysteriously into the dark water again, leaving widening rings on the water. Overhead the leaves whisked again, and little puffs of willow cotton blew down, and landed on the pool's surface. You gonna get that wood? George demanded. There's plenty right up against the back of that sycamore. Floodwater wood. Now you get it. Lenny went behind the tree and brought out a litter of dried leaves and twigs. He threw them in a heap on the old ash pile and went back for more and more. It was almost night now. A dove's wings whistled over the water. George walked to the fire pile and lighted the dry leaves. The flame cracked up among the twigs and fell to work. George undid his bindle and brought out three cans of beans. He stood them about the fire, close in against the blaze, but not quite touching the flame. There's enough beans for four men, George said. Lenny watched him from over the fire. He said patiently, I like them with ketchup. Well, we ain't got any, George exploded. Whatever we ain't got, that's what you want. 
God Almighty, if I was alone, I could live so easy. I could go get a job and work and no trouble, no mess at all. And when the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go into town and get whatever I want. Why, I could stay in a cat house all night. I could eat any place I want, hotel or any place, and order any damn thing I could think of. And I could do all that every damn month. Get a gallon of whiskey, or sit in a pool room and play cards or shoot pool. Lenny knelt and looked over the fire at the angry George, and Lenny's face was drawn with terror. And what do I got? George went on furiously. I got you. You can't keep a job, and you lose me every job I get. Just keep me shoving all over the country all the time. And that ain't the worst. You get in trouble. You do bad things, and I got to get you out. His voice rose nearly to a shout. You crazy son of a bitch. You keep me in hot water all the time. He took on the elaborate manner of little girls when they are mimicking one another. Just wanted to feel that girl's dress. Just wanted to pet it like it was a mouse. Well, how the hell did she know you just wanted to feel her dress? She jerks back and you hold on like it was a mouse. She yells and we got to hide in an irrigation ditch all day with guys looking for us. And we got to sneak out in the dark and get out of the country. All the time, something like that. All the time. I wished I could put you in a cage with about a million mice and let you have fun. His anger left him suddenly. He looked across the fire at Lenny's anguished face, and then he looked ashamedly at the flames. It was quite dark now, but the fire lighted the trunks of the trees and the curving branches overhead. Lenny crawled slowly and cautiously around the fire, until he was close to George. He sat back on his heels. George turned the bean cans so that another side faced the fire. He pretended to be unaware of Lenny so close beside him. George, very softly. No answer. George, what do you want? I was only fooling, George. I don't want no ketchup. I wouldn't eat no ketchup if it was right here beside me. If it was here, you could have some. But I wouldn't eat none, George. I'd leave it all for you. You could cover your beans with it, and I wouldn't touch none of it. George still stared morosely at the fire. When I think of the swell time I could have without you, I go nuts. I never get no peace. Lenny still knelt. He looked off into the darkness across the river. George, you want I should go away and leave you alone? Where the hell could you go? Well, I could. I could go off in the hills there. Some place I'd find a cave. Yeah? How'd you eat? You ain't got sense enough to find nothing to eat. I'd find things, George. I don't need no nice food with ketchup. I'd lay out in the sun, and nobody'd hurt me. And if I found a mouse, I could keep it. Nobody would take it away from me. George looked quickly and searchingly at him. I've been mean, ain't I? If you don't want me, I can go off in the hills and find a cave. I can go away any time. No, look, I was just fooling, Lenny. Because I want you to stay with me. Trouble with mice is you always kill them. He paused. Tell you what I'll do, Lenny. First chance I get, I'll give you a pup. Maybe you wouldn't kill it. That'd be better than mice, and you could pet it harder. Lenny avoided the bait. He had sensed his advantage. If you don't want me, you only just got to say so, 
and I'll go off in those hills right there, right up in those hills, and live by myself, and I won't get no mice stole from me, George said. I want you to stay with me, Lenny. Jesus Christ, somebody'd shoot you for a coyote if you was by yourself. No, you stay with me. Your Aunt Clara wouldn't like you running off by yourself, even if she is dead. Lenny spoke craftily. Tell me, like you done before. Tell you what? About the rabbits, George snapped. You ain't gonna put nothing over on me, Lenny pleaded. Come on, George, tell me. Please, George, like you done before. You get a kick out of that, don't you? All right, I'll tell you, and then we'll eat our supper. George's voice became deeper. He repeated his words rhythmically, as though he had said them many times before. Guys like us that work on ranches are the loneliest guys in the world. They got no family. They don't belong no place. They come to a ranch and work up a stake, and then they go into town and blow their stake, and the first thing you know, they're pounding their tail on some other ranch. They ain't got nothing to look ahead to. Lenny was delighted. That's it. That's it. Now tell how it is with us. George went on. With us, it ain't like that. We got a future. We got somebody to talk to that gives a damn about us. We don't have to sit in no bar room blowing in our jack just because we got no place else to go. If them other guys gets in jail, they can rot for all anybody gives a damn. But not us. Lenny broke in. But not us. And why? Because I got you to look after me, and you got me to look after you, and that's why. He laughed delightedly. Go on now, George. You got it by heart. You can do it yourself. No, you. I forget some of the things. Tell about how it's going to be. Okay. Someday we're going to get the jack together, and we're going to have a little house, and a couple of acres, and a cow, and some pigs, and, and live off the fat of the land, Lenny shouted, and have rabbits. Go on, George. Tell about what we're going to have in the garden, and about the rabbits in the cages, and about the rain in the winter, and the stove, and how thick the cream is on the milk like you can hardly cut it? Tell about that, George. Why don't you do it yourself? You know all of it. No, you tell it. It ain't the same if I tell it. Go on, George, how I get to tend the rabbits. Well, said George, we'll have a big vegetable patch, and a rabbit hutch, and chickens, and when it rains in the winter... We'll just say the hell with going to work, and we'll build up a fire in the stove, and sit around it, and listen to the rain coming down on the roof. Nuts, he took out his pocket knife. I ain't got time for no more. He drove his knife through the top of one of the bean cans, sawed out the top, and passed the can to Lenny. Then he opened a second can. From his side pocket he brought out two spoons and passed one of them to Lenny. They sat by the fire and filled their mouths with beans and chewed mightily. A few beans slipped out of the side of Lenny's mouth. George gestured with his spoon. What you gonna say tomorrow when the boss asks you questions? Lenny stopped chewing and swallowed. His face was concentrated. I... I ain't gonna say a word. Good boy. That's fine, Lenny. Maybe you're getting better. When we get the couple acres, I can let you tend the rabbits all right. Especially if you remember as good as that. Lenny choked with pride. I can remember, he said. George motioned with his spoon again. Look, Lenny, I want you to look around here. You can remember this place, can't you? The ranch is about a quarter mile up that way, 
Just follow the river. Sure, said Lenny, I can remember this. Didn't I remember about not going to say a word? Of course you did. Well, look, Lenny, if you just happen to get in trouble like you always done before, I want you to come right here and hide in the brush. Hide in the brush, said Lenny slowly. Hide in the brush till I come for you. Can you remember that? Sure I can, George. Hide in the brush till you come. But you ain't going to get in no trouble, because if you do, I won't let you tend the rabbits. He threw his empty bean can off into the brush. I won't get in no trouble, George. I ain't going to say a word. Okay, bring your bindle over here by the fire. It's going to be nice sleeping here, looking up, and the leaves. Don't build up no more fire. We'll let her die down. They made their beds on the sand, and as the blaze dropped from the fire, the sphere of light grew smaller. The curling branches disappeared, and only a faint glimmer showed where the tree trunks were. From the darkness, Lenny called, George, you asleep? No, what do you want? Let's have different color rabbits, George. Sure we will, George said sleepily. Red and blue and green rabbits, Lenny. Millions of them. Furry ones, George. Like I seen in the fair in Sacramento. Sure, furry ones. Cause I can just as well go away, George, and live in a cave. You can just as well go to hell, said George. Shut up now. The red light dimmed on the coals. Up the hill from the river, a coyote yammered, and a dog answered from the other side of the stream. The sycamore leaves whispered in a little night breeze.